Welcome to Tales from SYL Ranch, where everyone is entitled to my opinion. And I'm Bill Stone. Today I'm going to be doing a review of the new Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez flick, Knock Down the House. But first I'm going to talk to you a little bit about some background and things. First, I have a I have a background in theater, specifically acting, but I do have an eye for direction, cinematography, mechanics of making a film, and things like that. And consequently, I'm extremely conscious of the fact that editing plays a very key role in making documentaries, because a filmmaker might shoot 300 hours of footage, but they have to edit it down to a two-hour movie, and so therefore they have to make choices about what to put in the film and what not. And this means the documentary will almost always have an editorial bent. Otherwise, it wouldn't be a very engaging film. But that also means that a documentary can be complete propaganda, showing its subject either in a good or bad light, depending on how the filmmaker wants to edit it. So always remember about this, reality TV in particular, somebody's holding the camera and somebody's doing the editing. So it's not showing you real life. Now, there are some great examples of documentaries that have very often in their times be considered excellent and that won awards that are shown in schools to this day in some cases that are just utter and complete crap. So, for example, 1958, Disney made a documentary called White Wilderness, the second part of which was uh, about lemmings, and, and that part is linked to it in my description below. Now, they claimed that lemmings throw themselves off of cliffs. However, nothing what they showed in the film was considered realistic lemon, lemming behavior. For example, they filmed this thing in the Canadian province of Alberta, which is not a native habitat for lemmings, and it is landlocked with no outlets to the sea. The filmmakers had to import lemmings to Alberta for use in this documentary, reportedly by purchasing them from Inuit children who had caught them in other provinces. And then through the use of carefully controlled camera angles, tight editing, and uh, filmmaking, well, they made a few dozen lemmings look like a much larger number by putting them on turntables to make it look like they were having a frenzied migration effect and then just herding them off the cliff and into the water which, by the way, was actually the Bow River, not the Arctic Sea, as claimed. Disney was responsible for purveying a complete lie that persists to this very day. Other examples of documentaries considered great in their times. The 2006 Al Gore documentary, An Inconvenient Truth, which was supposedly about global warming. For example, Al Gore used CGI to portray ice shelves collapsing off into the water. He predicted that the Arctic would be completely melted by 2014. Sea levels would rise by at least 20 feet as a result of that and the melting of the Antarctic glacier, however, that has been gaining ice. And the melting of the Greenland ice sheets, however, that ice sheet re uh, melt and rest restoration is cyclical, that has not changed. And he uh, predicted that sea levels would be rising, uh, but uh, they, and they have been, but at a, the same rate that they always have since we've started recording things, nothing's changed. And if Al Gore really thought all of this crap was true, why would he have a beachfront mansion? Just saying. He also claimed that Hurricane Katrina was man-made. It was not. He claimed that severe tornadoes are increasing, they're declining. He claimed that polar bears are dying, and there are, in fact, today, more polar bears alive than when Al Gore was born. And yet, despite all of this idiocy and complete, false, and failed predictions, An Inconvenient Truth is still considered a great documentary and is still shown in both U.S. and broad schools. Other examples, 2004, Morgan Sparlock's uh, documentary Super Size Me. So for 30 days, he only ate food that was at McDonald's. He had to eat everything on the menu at least once, had to have three meals a day, and would only supersize his order when he was offered to do so. So he documented bizarre, terrifying changes his body went through while eating what, according to science, is not actual food. The problem is, no one has ever been able to replicate his results. Not scientifically, nor anecdotally. He seems to have made it up. Then there is Anything Made by Michael Moore, because Michael Moore does not make documentaries. He makes propaganda films with an extreme leftist bent. 
he edits things heavily. So for example, he might have someone who looks like they're asking a question and then getting an answer. What he'll do, however, is film shoot somebody asking a question, shoot somebody asking another question, shoot the answer to that question, but then hook it up in editing so as it appears like the first question is being answered. Does that sort of crap all the time. So, you must always watch a documentary with the knowledge that, at best, you are only seeing part of the story. And at worst, the whole thing is complete nonsense. And award-winning documentaries can be no more real than supposedly crappy ones. So I've kept that in mind when watching Knock Down the House, because I'm reasonably certain that that filmmaker, Rachel Lears, has a very specific leftist agenda in mind. Now, I used to do nothing but reviews for this program, and when doing so, I always tried to apply some fairly objective standards for acting, directing, cinematography, production design, costumes, makeup, etc. In the case of a documentary, you really only have direction, cinematography, and editing to go by, and uh, to some extent, body language of the subjects. But uh, to really review, that's all you really got from a purely objective perspective. So I'll be reviewing it from that objective perspective, but keeping an eye out for agendas or inaccuracies that the filmmakers may indu introduce. And I will have you know, oh man, I actually signed up for a free month of Netflix that I'll be terminating at the end of the month because I can find any TV or movie that I want for free somewhere on the CD underbelly of the internet. Pittsburgh. Oh, excuse me. BitTorrent! Oh, excuse me. But I did, I wanted to see it today, the day it came out, get the review out the door as soon as possible to strike while the iron is hot. So I just watched this one film to be the first among reviewing it. So I guess at this point, I would issue myself a... Spoiler alert. Spoiler alert. All hands, prepare for incoming spoilers. Yes, it is a spoiler alert. So if you haven't seen this film and you don't want it spoiled for you, go watch the film and come back to the video at this point for the review. So, the subject matter of this film, I, when I was reviewing films, I would probably have called this a plot, but it really isn't. Um, this uh, isn't exactly a plot, but again, keep in mind, somebody was holding the cameras and somebody was editing it, which means that try as they like, there's really no way that this could represent objective reality. Now, ostensibly, it's about four Democratic women who challenged incumbents in their primaries by veering to the extreme far left, generally socialist or outright communist. In practice, it kind of focuses on Alexandra Occasional Cortex, Red Cortez, because she was the only one to win the primary, and she got a lot of notoriety and still has some after the fact. So getting into some of the specifics of this, the director on this film and the, uh, also the cinematographer is Rachel Lears. Her IMDb is 2005 to 2020 with one in post. She has a seven cinematographer, seven producer, five director, two sound editor, three writer, two editor, and one editorial department credits. Almost all for generally the same films, which is not unusual. Um, these uh, documentaries are often a relatively small you know, number of people who make them, and they'll often have more than one job on a given film. In 2014, she won the Doc NYC, the Full Frame Documentary Film Festival Award, and a Sidewalk Film Festival Awards for The Hand That Feeds. She has this year won the Sundance Film Festival Awards and the Wisconsin Film Festival Award for this Knock Down the House, and she has four other nominations. In terms of direction, now, it is supposedly a documentary, therefore it should have minimal to no direction, but that's clearly not the case. Uh, neither in this nor in any other documentary. Subjects are often coached to c open up about certain subjects, not talk about others, and even sometimes specific things to say. Now, there's no good way to know when this has occurred in this film because, you know, you can have everything rearranged or removed completely in editing. And in addition, people tend to behave differently when there's a camera on them. They can be more intense when they're trying to talk about something or maybe more actively listening or looking as though they are. And this will kind of sometimes require outright direction on the part of the director. And they also tend to look at the camera, which in this case nobody does. I didn't catch anyone looking at the camera, which means to one of two things, they were either not coached not to do it or that any reactions to the camera were then edited out and left on the cutting room floor. 
And in addition, there are also issues with photo photography in general um, that are not, not supposed to be apparent, but are. And again, there's really no way to know when this has occurred, as it can be rearranged or removed completely in editing. In terms of the cinematography, as a, cin a documentary, there's supposed to be very little in terms of real cinematography. You just put your cam where it seems to be most appropriate at any given moment. And in practice, however, this is very different from that. Much of the time, there appears to have been a single cam on any given subject, which means that shots of reactions to that subject are taken afterwards. So what I'm saying is if you have a shot of somebody, you know, a candidate talking, you know, a constituents and saying this or that to some people in the room, if you're going to get reactions and you only have one cam pointing at the subject, that means after the fact, you're going to have to shoot reaction shots from other people. And that may involve outright direction. Um, you know, maybe you'll be able to find some where they're listening to the, to the subject talk about something else and get reactions from that. Again, where they're not matching up. Subject's talking about one thing, person's reacting to something completely different. Or maybe you just have outright direction where the director says, okay, I want you to look this direction a little farther that way because it looks better off the camera. Okay, now listen real closely. Act like you're listening to something important. You know, um, we don't know for sure when that happened. But there's no way to tell. But it did seem like probably there was only one camera as a, as a general rule on any given subject, which means when you see stuff like that, reactions to things that they are shooting the subject saying, that's picked up elsewhere somehow, whether it's either via outright direction or picking up a shot of someone reacting to something other than what's being said. Red Cortez seems to have possibly been the sole exception here because when she won the primary, I could see more than one cam. Um, at least two cams in the uh, uh, in the crowd, but um, I don't know. My gut tells me that that probably wasn't the case throughout most of the film. I think that they just thought she had the mo highest likelihood of winning, and had the biggest, frankly, primary party out there in any case. So they threw a couple of three cams in the in the uh, audience. Like, like I say, I could only see two for sure. There may have been more. Um, there was also a lot of attention paid to, to lighting. And this means that while the locations they shot weren't exactly studio conditions, they might as well have been because they were spending so much time setting up the lights and in particular making Red Cortez look as attractive and normal as possible. And that doesn't happen by accident. I can tell you, here, sitting in my little studio, I have three sets of lights, a key light and two lights at 45 degree angles to me that I spent a lot of time fiddling with to make sure that I looked human on this camera that I'm speaking to you on. This does not happen by accident. Neither does all of the very nicely lit shots that they have of Alexandria Occasional Cortex in this look. I mean, none of that's by accident. All of that has to be figured out in advance. You have to sit down and actually direct people. You know, make sure you don't turn more than 45 degrees this way or else we're going to cast a bad shadow across your face. You know, stuff like that. doesn't happen by accident. Um, and there were lights galore, many sides. So remember, uh, you know, it isn't, none of this is by accident. It may be a documentary, but that doesn't mean it's real life. You also have to remember, things like when a subject is shown entering a building, right? They'll show them coming in, coming in the door from one side and then coming into the room from the other side. Well, okay, suppose you're doing that with multiple cameras, okay? That means you have a camera covering the outside when they're going into the building and a camera coming the inside when they get into the building. But the people in the room know the subject is coming into the bill room because they're like standing there sitting there while they're setting up this camera. And so therefore, they're not giving actual, genuine, natural reactions to the candidate walking through the door. They know that they're coming. Now, it gets worse if you have only one cam because that means that the whole entrance was staged. That means that you have a camera and the person's coming in, they stop at the door, the camera goes in the door, sets up on the other side, and then they cue them to come in. Well, obviously, the whole thing is directed. The people in the room know exactly what's going on because the cam's coming in and they're waiting for the subject outside the door. And so they're clearly not giving genuine reactions. And, um, you know, in some cases, the people reacting to that subject are either coached so that they don't look at the camera, because I never saw that happen, or they are outright directed as to what to say and where to look. 
Now, the editor on here is Robin Blotnick. His IMDb is 2003 to 2019, with a gap between 2007 to 2014. He has a four editor, three director, three producer, three, one writer, one camera and electrical department, and one miscellaneous crew credit. And they generally overlap, as I say, not unusual in documentaries like this. And in 2014, he shared with the director and cinematographer the Doc NYC, the Full Frame Documentary Film Festival, and a Sidewalk Film Festival Awards for The Hand That Feeds. Editing here. This is difficult to judge, specifically, because no doubt hundreds of hours of footage were shot, which necessitates a lot of editing choices uh, about what to include in this film and what not. Um, and, you know, they would probably leave out just technical things, reactions to the camera, because I didn't see that very much. Uh, I didn't see it at all. Um, poor lighting conditions, bad sound, you know, all of that you just have to leave in the dumpster because it'll look like crap and sound like crap in your movie. And in any case, um, the clear intent of this was to produce a pro-socialist Democrat propaganda piece. So anything that's going to portray your subject in a less than favorable and glowing light is going to be left on the cutting room floor. Because I guess you can say in terms of the editing, well, this is a very well edited pro-socialist Democrat propaganda piece. Now the subjects of our uh, documentary Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez Red Cortez, who is now a congressman from New York's 14th District. She won her primary, just historically, we know this, she won her primary with 27,658 voters in the primary, meaning that she was effectively elected by only that small number of voters because New York's 14th District will never vote for anything other than a Democrat. Uh, Nancy Pelosi said it herself recently, I think her district would win if you adjust had a glass of water and taped a D to it. Now, in the popular vote, in the general election, there were 128,339 votes, of which uh, Red Cortez won about 78%. But again, um, those people were always going to go vote for a Democrat. It didn't matter what else was on the ticket. So effectively, she was elected by 15,897 people. And the film focuses very closely on her. Um, that reason is real simple. She's the only one who actually won the primary process. Um, and why she won, it kind of becomes apparent as you walk through this film. She has a lot of natural charisma. Now, charisma is something you're either born with, you either have it, or you don't. You cannot be taught it. Um, if I had it, I would probably have stayed an actor and been a successful one, as opposed to going on to be an IT, where you don't need to have charisma. Um, but it's something you can't be taught. Um, I'm always reminded in terms of charisma, the most charismatic person I've ever seen, Hulk Hogan. Um, in the, his heyday, in the 1980s, you know, in the, in the heyday of Hulkamania, um, when you saw him on TV, he, he looked pretty damn charismatic. But I had occasion to see him once uh, in the ring, in person. Uh, he was in a tag team match with Hillbilly Jim, and they were fighting a Nikolai Volkov and the Iron Sheik. And um, not only did he have a lot of magnetism, a lot of presence, just somebody you wanted to look at and wanted to win, but he knew how to work that crowd. He really knew how to work the crowd. Hillbilly Jim would be in that ring getting the snot beat out of him, and Hulk would not tag in until he'd gone, should I tag in to every single side of the house? And once he had them screaming that he should tag in, then he tagged in. Um, he really knew how to work that crowd. He was extremely charismatic. It was after watching him that I went, oh, oh, I bet I know how this is Hitler came to power. <laughs> a charismatic guy, but an evil one, you know. So um, Red Cortez does have a fair amount of charisma. That comes through even in television. I'm sure it does in person. And she knew how to run an effective primary campaign. Uh, it doesn't become immediately apparent that she has no idea what she's talking about with regards to issues because the documentary isn't really focusing on that part of it. Aside from showing that she's backed by socialist and communist groups and, the, you know, and that she has some very basic socialist positions, the film spends very little time on that and almost all of it on the campaign itself. Now, the film shows almost absolutely nothing that is negative about AOC, which is not realism. In real life, people do stuff that, you know, you wish it hadn't said or, 
you know, um, something maybe is personal about you that isn't all that appealing, and they left all that on the cutting room floor. It just positively fawns over her. The opening shots, things that struck me, the opening shots are of her putting on her makeup and then bitching about all the choices women have to make about their appearances, for which I have a certain level of sympathy for, but by the same token, treating it as something unique to her just seems kind of stupid to me. They also, at the beginning, spent some time following her around at her bartender's job, which was shot to appear extremely menial, with AOC bitching about the long hours she had. God. I have to sh tell you, Sugar Pumpkin, um, every IT professional in this country works 50 to 60 hours a week. We are on call 24-7, 365, and we have to use brain sweat. And when we have something break, unlike a glass... We are under enormous pressure to get it fixed ASAP because being down could cost hundreds of thousands and in some cases millions of dollars every single minute that it's down. So I'm sorry, I'm going to fail to have much sympathy for a bartender. Thank you very much. The film ends with uh, her winning her primary and then going to DC and crying because of course she knew that after she'd won the primary, it was in the bag, because New York 14 will never, ever vote for anything other than a Democrat, no matter how stupid they may happen to be. This sort of primarying is the sort of thing, you know, in which 15,897 people decided the congressperson, um, who has ludicrous positions and who is demonstrably as dumb as the eraser on the end of a number two pencil, this is something that Democrats are going to need to watch out for, unless they actually want their party to be full-on socialist, which, you know, kind of seems like the case a lot of the time. But they need to particularly watch out for it in Red Cortez's generation and later, because these were the generations formerly indoctrinated by 12 years of compulsory education that does not educate, see my series on this, America's Broken Schools, link in the description, but they were indoctrinated to believe in communist philosophies. And in fact, I think that if at all possible, we should not allow um, Red Cortez and her generation or later to ever come to power because they'll all be like she is and we'll be facing the situation that Venezuela is right now, but in short order. Other subjects of this film, uh, Joe Crowley, he's the former congressman from NY14, defeated by Red Cortez in the primaries. He was made every single time out. He was made to uh, appear to be completely unprepared to face a primary challenger, which may be true. He hadn't had one in 14 years, um, but he was made to look very slick, kind of sleazy, or just looked outright scared of Red Cortez, which I don't know if necessarily was true or not. Another subject was Cori Bush, who lost her primary in Missouri's first district. She was made to appear to be running because of St. Louis crime um, and Black Lives Matter. Uh, she's very close to uh, where Michael Brown was shot. Um, you may remember Michael Brown was the guy who was supposedly, hands up, don't shoot that guy when he was shot by a cop. Well, unfortunately for him and everybody else who f supported him, forensic evidence showed that he was in fact running toward the cop with his hands down after having intended to take the cop's firearm through the squad car window, firing the gun in the process Brown did, and injuring his own hand. And this is one of the many reasons that I personally find BLM, Black Lives Matter, rather odious. Because they're holding up Michael Brown as a poster child of innocence when he is anything but. And, uh, you know, um, Cori Bush's support of BLM and continuing to mislead the public about Brown or to, is too dumb to know, one of the two, just soured on me on her instantly. And frankly, I'm glad that she lost her primary. Then we have Paula Jean Swearinger, who lost her primary for West Virginia's U.S. Senate. Strangely enough, you know, I do research for this, right? And I looked her up in Wikipedia, and strangely enough, Wikipedia didn't know her birth date. It shows it is 1973 to 74. However, there's a tweet from her that I happened across that shows her birth date is June 13th, 1974. Um, so somebody should probably update her Wikipedia page. By the way, if anybody wants to create a Wikipedia page for me, I'm happy to work with you to get the facts right. <laughs> she was made to appear as though she was running uh, due to environmental and health concerns for West Virginia coal miners. Not as heavily focused on her because, again, she lost. 
Then there was Anthony, Amy, rather, Amy Villela, who lost the uh, Nevada no District 14 primary. She was made to appear to be as though she was running, largely due to her daughter's untimely death at the age of 22, which she blames on an emergency room staff who did not make appropriate tests on her daughter due to lack of insurance, and that this failure to make those tests led to a pulmonary embolism. This claim was never investigated by the filmmaker. A good documentary filmmaker, when they heard something like that, would try to find out if that's an accurate statement, or at least get the other side, but they didn't. And again, it was not as heavily focused on her because she lost. So, end of the review. We might ask ourselves, as I always do with reviews, is it any good? Well, it's neither tedious nor boring. It is a pro-socialist propaganda piece. If you like pro-socialist propaganda pieces, you'll probably like this. If you're not a pro-socialist, well, I'm not, you more probably won't like it either. Um, there's certainly a lesson to be had here about how to win a primary, at least for Democrats in certain major metro areas. Uh, it might be worth emulating if you're a Democrat. Um, if you're not, well, you might take this as a cautionary tale. Would I recommend this to my friends? No, but most of my friends are libertarians who could care less anyway. Would I recommend it more generally? I mean, I guess. Um, but I would not get a Netflix account specifically for this. Uh, just wait for the film to, uh, you know, show up on the seedy underbelly of the internet somewhere. BitTorrent! Oh, excuse me. BitTorrent! Oh, pardon me. Huh. <sighs> so... That is all I have to say about that for today. So thanks for watching. And if you like what I'm doing, you know, please feel free to like this video, subscribe to my channel, hit the notification bell, share me on social media, and to tell all of your friends, family, neighbors, pets, and livestock to do the same. I would certainly appreciate your support via subscribe star, my PayPal tip jar, or a place on my website where you can support me further. And there are links to all three of those in my description box below. So thanks for watching Tales from SYL Ranch. And remember, for a breath of fresh air, watch Tales from SYL Ranch, where everyone is entitled to my opinion. And I'm Bill Stone. Ultimate power in this world has always been one simple thing, the control and manipulation of minds.